All right. Okay. I'll try to make this quick before the Blue Angels start <laughs> roaring across the rooftop here. Um, anyways, I'm here to talk about sales selection uh, for Pack Up. Um, I'm open to questions if you have questions as I bring something up. So uh, as long as we don't drag it out too long, I'm fine. So if, you, if there's something you don't understand, we have questions, feel free to, to ask, raise your hand. Um, so the goal in sales selection is to basically take as few sales as possible that will cover all the wind ranges that you'll have in the race. Um, it's probably counterintuitive to think a sale maker would tell you to take as few sales as possible, but it really is important <laughs> in this race to minimize your sale inventory. You want to keep the boat light. Everything that you put on the boat is going to slow the boat down. So sales, sales are very important um, to uh, basically eliminate the weight out of the boat, but also don't want to take a lot of space. You'll find when you go offshore, if you don't stack the sails on the rail, the majority of the sails will be sitting in the cabin until so getting in the way climbing over and the crew will be sleeping on it and so on. So having a lot of sails just gets in the way. So to do that, um, you basically want to take a, develop a sail inventory um, where a sail can be used through a wide wind range. And to have a sail that can be used through a wide wind range, you need something that's made light and strong so that it's light will work in lighter breeze or less apparent winds and strong so that it can go up range. And when I say up range, you know, basically increased wind velocity. Um, the more up range the sail will go, you know, the, the wider wind range that sail will have. Um, and then that would eliminate potentially another sail. So when I say, uh, you know, what, what's a sail that's going to be good up range, it's, you know, wide range is going to be something made from low strike materials, aramid, carbon, dyneema, you know, not dacron, not polyester. Um, you know, if we're talking, not talking about spinnakers here, which is generally going to be all nylon, but for head sails, uh, really look at head sails that are made out of low strength materials, like the ones listed here. Um, the biggest way to keep your sail inventory simple, eliminate a lot of unnecessary sails, is to develop sails that can be sort of dual purpose. In. So instead of taking a number one and a jib top, develop a number one that could work as a jib top or a jib top that could work as a number one jib top. Um, you know, same as a, as a number three jib, take a number three jib that could also work as a blast creature. You know, basically a higher clue number three jib that would be dual purpose. Um, if you're, you know, if you're gonna do a lot of cruising after the race or you're, you know, Taking into consideration the delivery return that a heavy weather jib or a blast reacher, you know, a high clue uh, number three jib or number four jib will actually make a really nice delivery sale, a nice cruising sale. So factor that into your uh, decision making and your sale inventory. Um, last note I have here is you can really increase the range of your head sales by uh, outboard leads, different lead positions. And I'll go into that in a little bit. All right, so these are sort of the, the three stages of the race that you guys will probably know as well, if not from today, from all the other reading and uh, information gathered from this race. Uh, it's kind of a little chart of what the winds kind of look like. When you start, you can see that the winds, and this is actually not back up, this is trans back, so those San Francisco's up there, but you can find the routing that has. Uh, from Pacific Cup, but you'll notice that in the initial part of the race, that it's going to be upwind. Start, go out the bridge, upwind, and then you're going to be fairly headed until you get out past the parallels, and then it's slowly going to lift a little bit, but you're going to be close reaching. You're going to be going upwind to very close reaching with a head sail or reaching sail for a good portion of the race, and it's not until you get into the Really, until you cross the ridge, get into the sort of the second part of the breed, uh, race, which you know, slot cars is what Stan Honey calls it, where you're really going towards a reaching spinnaker or a spinnaker. 
Um, and then it's really, you know, maybe about halfway before you get into sort of full running conditions. And then at this point, it's just full BMG sailing straight to the finish line as best as you can, as best uh, BMG sailing that your boat will allow you to sail. So that's kind of what the what the course looked like, wind directions will look like. This is a sail selection chart. Um, and this has a, a variety of sails. This is back does this look familiar to you at all, Michael? Just a lot. Thank yeah, it's much. a Santa Cruz 50 uh, sail chart. So Santa Cruz 50 is larger boat, obviously, it's gonna have a good number of sails. You know, this is a lot more sails than you would take, say, like double on a 30, 35 foot boat. But it's pretty reflective of a wide range of sales. Um, and the sail chart, I encourage everyone to develop one so that your crew understands what sail to use when. When you're sailing in a race, you want to make it sort of a no brainer. You want to be able to look at the sail chart. You want to be, have your crew understand what sail should be up when, nighttime, you're tired trying to decide, you know, would we be better off right now with, uh, you know, code zero or, you know, a reaching spinnaker, a 3A, you know, look look at the sail chart. So develop a sail chart with your crew, with your sail maker. Um, this is something when, if you have time that you should be testing on your boat and finding sort of the overlaps in the wind speeds and in the wind angles, right? So we've got two wind angles going across, and true, sorry, true wind angle going down and true wind speed going across. And just finding sort of the overlaps, you know, going from your number one general to a code zero, you know, a code zero to your reaching spinnaker, um, you know, your number three jib to a jib top, uh, you know, two A spinnaker to your four S spinnaker or four A spinnaker. Um, these are not very defined. This chart I find easier to read than there's other, I'll show you another sail chart that has a lot of curves and I find a little more difficult to read. Uh, but if you develop something like this, you put it on the bulkhead or you put it in the cockpit, educate your crew on it. And then when you come to those points in the race where you need to change sails, this is, can be very helpful, very informational. All right, so upwind sails. You're really not going to go upwind for that long. Um, start, you know, it could be upwind tacking for 20 to a couple of hundred miles. Um, I think a lot of people don't put a lot of weight into the mainsail. They go with the mainsail they have. Okay, that's fine. It's a downwind race. It's not that critical. You know, let's focus on the spinnaker and so on. That's all good. Except that if your mainsail is not up to the task, it can be a real problem. I mean, it could jeopardize your race. And no, a number of boats that have had to retire because they've gotten out of conditions where they've had to flog their main and broken their main, and essentially you can't sail another 18, 1900 miles to Hawaii without a working main. So make sure your mainsail is up to the task. Even if you decide you don't need a full race main, having a good main that can make it is important. And don't just think about getting to Hawaii. If you're going to sail the boat back, obviously you're going to need a good sail as well. So either you're going to have a delivery main lined up, maybe your older main, which you also need to make sure is up to the task, or you may use this sail as well. So if you're thinking about budgeting in your inventory, think about what your main has to do beyond getting the boat to Hawaii. Um, other thing is that you'll do some weather routing, you'll do your weather briefings before the race and so on. You'll have your allotment of head sails. So say you're sailing on a you know 35, 40 foot boat, you have a, a number one Genoa, you have a number three jib, you have maybe a few reaching sails in there, and you realize in the forecast that you're not going to need the number one. It's going to be windy at the start, it's going to be windy all the way out past the Farallons, and then maybe at that point you might go into a reaching sail. So you could leave your number one on the dock. You know, don't take that weight if you're not going to use the sail. Um, I mean, it's, it's unique in the sense that this race that you need to be able to sail upwind for, you know, again, anywhere from, you know, 40 to a few hundred miles. But uh, if you don't see that you're going to use a sail based on your weather forecasting, 
you know, leave, leave it on the dock. So that, that's a common. We'll pick our head sail uh, the morning of the race and then decide, okay, we're going to take our, you know, our medium jib and we're going to leave our light jib on the dock. Okay, close reaching sails. To me, the race is won and lost on the reaching portion. Um, this is where you can get the most out of your boat. And this is also where I feel that people don't try and get the most out of the boat because reaching seems so simple. You know, you just sort of ease the sails and you reach. But there's actually a lot of development that's gone into reaching sails. Um, and there's a lot of different options on how to power your boat up. So jib top is essentially like a high clue dental. So if you have a boat that carries 155% number one, a jib top would be a same sail area sail, um, same LP measurement, uh, but it's left perpendicular. So same as your, as your essentially as your number one, but it's a high clue sail. So it's going to be uh, a much better reaching sail you're gonna put it on an outboard lead and having the high clue, what allows you to do is just ease your main more before it starts to lock from the back wind of the, of the sail. So you'll be able to sail maybe 10, 15 degrees lower with the jib top than you would with the number one general, maybe even more than that, depending on the boat and configuration and so on. So jib top can be a pretty important sail. Again, you could use that for a large portion of the reaching, the upwind is pretty short. I've done, I've designed a number of sails that are sort of a hybrid number one jib top. So it's enough to get you out the gate. And if it's a lighter start that you can tack with, but it has a high clue that it really sort of doubles up as a, as a jib top reaching sail. Uh, the blast reacher is a high clue, uh, like a number three jib or number four jib. Sail that's probably more often used in this race on a lot of conventional boats. Um, that people give credit for. Code zero is a reaching spinnaker. I'll show you that in a minute. Code 65, code 55, cleaner. These are names for reaching sails that are not a spinnaker, not a code zero, which qualifies as a spinnaker, and not a head sail. And I'll show you that in a minute. A3 spinnaker is a reaching spinnaker. That's a pretty common spinnaker to have. Some boats that only carry symmetrics would have, you know, A, A stands for asymmetric. Three is the, uh, is the refers essentially to the design shape of the sail. Reaching sails are odd numbered, A1, A3, A5. Uh, running sails are typically even numbers. So like an A2, A4, A6 would be a heavier running spinnaker. Uh, if you're symmetric, you know, S2, S4, running spinnakers, um, A1, or sorry, S1, S3 would be reaching spinnakers. Uh, all right, so I talked a little bit about the blast reacher. You can see this is just sort of not really in the condition that you use a blast reacher, but it's, you know, it's a jib, it's a high clue. That's where a number three jib, the clue would be down here on the deck. Having that clue higher up, it's further away from the boat. You use a sheet that allows you to let the main out. A good blast reacher in the sail is going to be effective from 18, 20 knots to you know 30, 35 knots with the reef or two reefs in your main. So it's a very important tool to have on those boats. Have some type of sail. It could double as your heavy weather jib, which is one of the required sails, or could be one of the required sails. Um, again. You know, here in this image, you can see kind of like a three, number three jib, there's the mast. Number three typically doesn't overlap the mast very much. Here you go, the blast reacher. It's a little bit smaller and a higher clue. It's a good heavy weather jib. It's a good delivery sail or cruising sail. If you make it out of the right materials, it could be a great cruising sail for many years after. Okay, so what is a code zero? I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with code zeros. Um, they're pretty common nowadays. They're most effective on boats with fractional rigs. Um, a code zero qualifies as a spinnaker because it has a mid girth. Spinnakers are defined by the mid girth. If it has a mid girth of 75% or larger, it's a spinnaker. So code zero is essentially a sailor that developed early days of the Volvo race. And they basically figured out a way to make a spinnaker into a really good close reaching sail, almost like a general. 
but it still qualifies as a spinnaker because the mid girth right here is 75% of the foot length. Okay, anything smaller would be considered a tweener. And if it's 50% or smaller than the foot length, it would be a head sail. So this is what a code zero would look like. A tweener, or we call it code 65, um, it would be essentially like a code zero, but eliminating the aft edge of the sail, making a little bit flatter sail, making it a better upwind, close reaching sail. Not as effective for more broader angles that the code zero would be useful for, but definitely better for close reaching. Code 55, also called, but also known as a tweener, has even less mid girth, right? 55% of the foot length. It almost looks like in this, this image, you can see it's going off of the bow strip, pole. Um, it's like a big sort of loose left upwind gentle. Yeah. The, the last feature of yeah. the last image. Yeah. Uh, would you call that um, a stay sail as well? Or would you use it as a stay sail? No, I, that's a good question. Um, on some boats, it just depends how big the four triangle it is of your inner head stay. So on some boats that have sort of a twin head stay setup, maybe you have a four stay just inside of the other four stay, then it probably would work fine. But if you're referring to more of a cutter rig type boat where it has a very small four triangle, then it probably wouldn't provide quite enough power. So it'd be something that really go off your main head stay. So yeah. Yeah. Um, the tweener, if it's yeah. um it looks like it's no longer classified as a spinnaker. What yeah. kind of uh, ratings did it associate with that? So it's, it's a good question. Um, it's a little different for every boat. It's uh, it basically is rated as a sail under ORR. Um, how how it impacts you would have to run trials really up. It's going to be different for every boat. There's no specific penalty for it. Under PHRF, we look at these sales on a sort of individual basis. So if you have one under, you know, in your sale of, under the PHRF packed up certified rating, we would look at it sort of on a boat by boat basis. It's generally like a three second penalty to carry a sale like that. Um, but that's very general to say that and we have to take a look at it. Yeah, Michael. On, on, so he built one for me on, on uh, Oaxaca and the hit was very minor and it was unbelievably worth it, particularly in the close to the coast. It was very worth it, particularly uh, reaching down the coast. To give you an idea, I sailed the pack up uh, about 10 years ago on a Swan 45. And the Swan 45 is a boat that uh, does not have an overlapping dip, doesn't have a channel, right? It just has non overlapping dips, which are size of about 105%. So, and the shrouds, the chain plates are out essentially to the side. So you can't really put a number one Genoa on it and sheet it in and go upwind. But what we did, and this is really before the tweener sales came out and before they were legal, <laughs> um, is we built 155% Genoa and just designed it for reaching kind of a jib top, essentially more of a jib top than a Genoa. And we were only going to use it for reaching because we couldn't sheet it in tight enough because the spreaders are so wide on this boat. We raced ORR and we ran a trial certificate for that particular sale and it penalized us seven minutes for the race, I mean, which is nothing for, I mean, we ended up using that. I sold two races on that boat. We ended up using that sale for, I think, in one race, no less than eight hours, another race for like a day. I mean, it's, it would offer probably another knot and a half of boat speed uh, to the boat having that sail. So the rating penalty was negligible for that particular sail. Now, if we <laughs> use that same sail on the same boat, ORR today may look at it a little bit differently. I don't know. You have to, if you want to optimize your boat for to certain sails for the race, you have to run trials. And trials are fairly inexpensive and they'll give you a good feedback before you decide to invest in the sale. So I, I definitely recommend, that is if you're sailing ORR. If you're sailing PHRF, it's a different deal. Still might be a good idea to just 
before you build the sale to see what your THRF rating might come back at and see if it's worth doing or not. But generally these sales are not penalized that much for this particular race and they're very effective regional sales. So, okay. Any other questions on the tweener? What is the analysis for the, uh, the trial? <laughs> Um, so if you sent in an application, so if you just filled one out and put all your data in there and you put the data of this particular sale that you wanted, you're thinking about building for the race and you filled out all that information, you submitted it to U.S. Sailing, then they would come back with a rating. And in order to have a trial be effective, you need to know what your rating is without that sale, obviously, right? So you have a rating for your bow. And then you have a rating for your boat plus that sale, and then you just look at the differences in the time. And that's that's essentially what you do. A lot of boats will run multiple trials based on multiple sales, maybe doing different things with displacement, ballast. You know, there's a lot of optimizing that can go on under ORR. A little bit of optimizing you can do in PHRF, but ORR is very specific uh, to little details and measurements and weight. Okay. All right. I put this in here. I'm not sure uh, how much people have seen um, what they call now sort of quote unquote cable free code zeros or cable free reaching sales. At North Sales, we call it the Helix sale. This is probably the biggest development in sale design technology in, in a number of years. And what it is, is that the old style code zeros or loose luff sails would have a cable in the luff and all the load would be on that cable, right? So it'd be like taking your number one Genoa and putting a cable, a wire or a Dyneema luff rope in it and all the load would be on that, not on, not on the sail. So what this helix sail is or cable free sail is, is the structure is now in the luff of the sail and a lot less on the load of, on the cable. And by doing that, and I should say that these cable-free sails don't aren't really cable-free because they're generally furling sails because uh, they'd be very hard to handle. Try lowering your number one if it's not on hangs or in the foil, right? They'd be very hard to handle. So uh, they're almost all of them are on furlers, um, and they do have a rope just. To help with the furling. So you kind of need that left rope. So they're not totally cable free, but what they mean by cable free, what we call our helix sails, is that the structure is in the left of the sail. It's not putting so much load on the cable. The benefit of that, so this is a more conventional code zero with a cable. This is a helix left sail. You can see what the load on the cable does. The sail sags to lure. Okay, here. When you don't put so much load on the cable and it's dispersed through the left of the sail, the left of the sail actually becomes positive. And it gives you sort of this positive luff, which is much more efficient for reaching, much more powerful. And it also gives the sail a lot more range. By having that positive luff, you can sail a little bit lower. And just imagine your asymmetric spinnaker, when you ease the sheet out, you see the luff sort of go out to weather a little bit out in front of the boat, out, out to weather. The same thing that's going on with these Felix Love sails, as opposed to this sail, you ease it out. Maybe the cable unloads a little bit, it'll straighten up, but it won't actually go to the weather. So that's a big development. So when I talked earlier about, you know, how to how to increase the range of your sail inventory, sail inventory, this is one example of where you can sort of increase the range of your code zero. Uh, it'll actually give you a little more. Uh, angle, a little more of a broader angle, a little bit lower angle compared to a conventional code zero. Okay. Uh, so here, right, cable supported, you can see those stag. This is looking, if you were laying on the deck and looking up top of the mast, this is the love right here. You can see the stag, okay. Now with all the load structure in the sail, as opposed to on the cable, it's actually slightly positive. So that's what that image is. Um, 
there's here's kind of a photo. When you're close reaching, sailing as high as you can possibly sail, it's nice. It's not as important, but where it really is important is when you do crack off and you ease that sail. And now the sail becomes a very nice sort of close reaching sail to a more of a broad reaching sail. Right. So you can see what a straight left would be. Look like would be this yellow line. You can see the positive block here. Here's the structure. You can kind of see how it's a bit more positive. So having a sail like this may eliminate the need for like an A3 spinnaker, a reaching spinnaker. So this is a sail that could work well close winded and also as a kind of a close reaching spinnaker. So again, another opportunity to eliminate a sail from your engine. Okay, here's a code zero. Um, you know, to meet the rule as a spinnaker, we mentioned earlier how the mid girth has to be 75%. When you have this mid girth of 75%, the back of the sail is so flat because it's a flat sail that it typically just, the back end just flats. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't have the support. You have a little this sort of positive area in the back of the sail. It's not doing anything. It, and if anything, it's just drag, but it's there because it keeps the rule. A more efficient sail would be a code 65 and kind of cut that back end off. The only time that back end becomes useful is when you ease the sail. Now it's sail area, it's increased power. Um, with a cabled sail where it, the sail really sags a lot, a lot of that excess material is in the back. Now, when you have these cable free sails, this helix. You have that left positive, the back of the sail doesn't flap near as much. So now the sail is, is a much more efficient sail as a result. Does that have a leech cord though? Yeah. 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 As I as I said, even these cable free sails, they do have cables in them so they can furl. You can see this is on a little code zero furler. There is a cable in there. If you didn't have a cable, you wouldn't be able to furl the sail, right? They do have leech boards. All your spinnakers, unless you're sailing on the dinghy or a very small keel boat, all your spinnakers actually have leech and left boards. Asymmetrics will have leech and left boards and hook boards in them. Symmetrics will have leech boards in them. You may not ever notice that, but they actually do have them. Okay, A3. So this is more of a classic reaching spinnaker. Um, and C. What it looks like here again, you know, if you're carrying symmetric spinnakers only, um, it would be considered an S3, uh, and it, it's just a flatter reaching sail. So, here, as I mentioned earlier about the sail chart where you have a lot of curves, I think the, you know, the more of the, uh, the grid is just easier to read. But again, we've got the same thing in your case. Wind speed going across the bottom here, you have. Uh, wind angle on the left here, and then you kind of look for those overlaps in the wind. This is actually sort of what it looks like. It's just not so easy to read. You know, it's like not that easy. At least for me, it's not that easy. And you want to make this brainless when you're in the middle of the night. You're tired. Day four, going to the race, trying to decide: do we change or we keep the sail up? Okay, we talked a little bit about outboard leads. Most everyone here, I'm sure, knows what an outboard lead is, has used an outboard lead. Um, there's nothing really uh, unknown about outboard leads other than for the sales that you have, make sure you know where they need to be located. Uh, spend the time to actually practice using them to make sure your sale is being used efficiently. So, uh, like on this boat here, this is just a uh, just a fairly, you know, just a, a spare sheet or a short sheet. We just open the close the jib to here and back to the wind. You know, this boat here has got a couple of pad eyes. You can put a snap block on your sheet. Take your lazy, your weather tip sheet, and run it through there. If you're going out the bridge or go up the fair lines and you're going from upwind to close reaching. You put on the outboard lead, all of a sudden the slot between your head sail and your main opens up, allows you to use your main, and now the boat goes much faster. The main's not clogging here as much. So, again, most boats have these. 
But if you don't have an outboard lead set up, spend some time figuring out where it should go and how to how to set it up. And it's important for any race that you do, not just the pack step. I mean, just here in the bay, if you're reaching and you can't carry your spinnaker, if you can put your head sail on an outboard lead, you're going to go a lot faster than if you just leave it through the regular jib, jib track or jib fairly. Um, all right, so get into staysails a little bit. Um, primarily Genoa staysails. Genoa staysails are something you don't see on boats, oh, probably under 40 feet very often. Um, this is probably more of a higher end you know, racing thing, but it is a nice thing to have if you have it in your budget. Um, on a lot of race boats, it's pretty critical sail to have. It adds power, but mainly it adds balance. And we'll get into the Spinnaker staysail in a second. So, but the most important thing about staysail, aside from the added sail area, is that it helps keep the boat tracking. So it really reduces the amount of helm that you have and just keeps the boat going along in the way so you don't have to oversteer so much. So staysail. Aside from the sail air, which can give you a couple of tenths of a knot of speed, will just allow you to sail a straighter line, uh, not turn the rudder as much, which is going to add up to a couple of tenths of speed as well. Is that because yeah. it's driving the mainsail better? It's pushing down on the bow more. So you have, yeah, in a sense, you're pushing on the bow down and just keeping the boat going, um, you know, in a straight where you get into swells and if you just have a head sail in the main the boat, it's going to run around that and then you're going to force it down. It's going to run around that and you're going to force it down. Having that stasel is going to help it go straight. Spinnaker stasel, kind of the same thing. You're on a wave. The extra sail area will give you a little bit more maybe to get down the wave when you're in that marginal surfing condition. But also, again, you know, when you get down a wave and the boat just sort of loads up, but you come off the surf or off the wave, the boat loads up. It kind of wants to head up because it's so loaded up, being able to pressure on the main. Having that staysail will help keep that bow down. So a lot of people think it's just like, okay, it's added sail here, which for sure it is and it's important, but it's also just a way to balance the boat. It's balancing the boat is really critical for your boat speed. All right, so a better picture of the of a Genoa staysail right here. It's not a not a real big sail. Genoa staysail, you asked a question earlier about on a like on a more cutter rig setup. That that's pretty much where your general stays still would go. <laughs> so um, something that it's it's funny the sport you look at design and sails and all that and everything sort of comes full circle and you look at all the traditional boats they're all cutter rig for a reason. It's like okay we're kind of back at it here. Um, all right, so here's Spinnaker Staysail, uh, pretty straightforward. On a boat with a spinnaker pole, you have the ability to tack the spinnaker staysail to the weather rail. So you usually will have three locations to tack the spinnaker staysail. You can see here it's on the weather rail, weather rail, the center line, and then you have one on the other side, which would be the weather rail on the other side. Um, not much to them. The one thing that's important again is that the spinnaker staysail should also be your drifter or your slatting sail. Then a few pack cups where you get off the fair lines <laughs> and the wind shuts off and you're just floating all night and into the next day trying to get out to the breeze and the boat is just rolling back and forth. The staysail, the spinnaker staysail made out of a night, a light nylon or a, I should say a heavy nylon or a light, uh, like a mylar polyester film or so on. Uh, designed so that the clue doesn't really overlap the mass. So when you're slatting back and forth, it's a really great sail to stabilize the boat and generate a little bit of um, boat speed and a little bit of apparent wind. And if you're sailing in zero to four knots, that's the sail that you would have up. And then once you develop enough apparent, then you may go to your, you know, your jib top or your boat zero or whatever your reaching sail is. And I've had it where you're frequently going back and forth to develop apparent. You get the boat going, you put your code zero up, sail for a little while, then speed drops and wind speed drops and you go back to the back to your staysail. So, um, but again, this is like a dual purpose sail. It's a very important sail to have as a spinnaker staysail, but also important to have as a drifter. 
So, so are, yeah. you, are you creating a current when, when you do that? Yeah, so it's this say it's your zero 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 on the boat speed, and basically, you know, maybe one or two knots of breeze at the masthead, and you're rolling back and forth in the swells, and having that, you know, it fills and it goes back, and it fills and it goes back. And now you're starting to develop a little bit of apparent wind and a little bit of boat speed. And then as your boat speed builds, and now your apparent wind is building, and now you can get the boat going. You know, maybe two, three knots, and you know, one, two knots of wind, and you try to keep that momentum going as long as possible. And you build a enough apparent speed, then you can maybe go to a larger, fuller sail. So, all right, uh, okay, downwind sails. Uh, I think it's very important to carry at least two spinnakers. It's a long race, and if you break one spinnaker. Your only spinnaker is a much longer race. So I definitely recommend carrying a second spinnaker. Um, and most boats, you know, will carry three, four, five spinnakers. Um, but definitely if you're doing this race, get a backup spinnaker, whether you either use the one you have and build a new one, or whether you find someone with a similar boat or sail that will fit, but just it's peace of mind to have one. Uh, no, to have a backup. So for sure, carry at least two spinnakers. Um, you know, like the majority of the race is going to be sailed in about eight to 18 knots. So a light, medium spinnaker is what you would be using 80% of the time that you have an actual spinnaker up more often than not. At nighttime squalls, it can get quite greasy. And it's good to have a heavy spinnaker. So if you're going to build an inventory of just two spinnakers, carry a light medium one and carry a heavy one. So a light spinnaker would be considered like an A1, A15, an A2, or an S1, S2, or in a lot of terminology of you know boats from 30, 40 years ago. I'm sure a lot of you have them in your garage, but you know, referred to as like a half ounce, I've got a half ounce, I've got a three-quarter ounce, I've got an ounce. Now we call them more by the design shape and we call them by the weight of the sail. But for a lot of people, they don't necessarily know what, you know, what an S2 is, but they'll know what their half is, they'll know what their ounce is. So a light medium would be considered something made out of half or 0.6 ounce fabric nylon, um, and would be referred to as an S1, S2, or an A1, A2. Uh, heavy spinnaker, ounce and a half. Uh, would be made generally depending on the boat, something of similar weight. And again, it would be your A4, your A5, or your S4, or your S5. Um, an A3, a reaching spinnaker, you know, or if you have a cruising asymmetric or a jenniker or so on, that could serve as your A3. And uh, if it's made out of an ounce and a half or a similar type material, it could also be your heavier spinnaker. Um, Problem is, if you get into squalls, your best downwind sailing straight, you know, your best BMG is going straight downwind. An A3 is a reaching sail. So, if you can generate enough speed to offset, you know, the distance lost by sailing at a higher angle with a with a heavy reaching spinnaker, then it then it's worthwhile. Um, you know, really fast boats like the one in the picture. Your apparent when it gets windy, your apparent uh, wind goes so far forward. That the A3 actually is the heavier spinnaker, but on a more conventional boat, heavier displacement boat, an A3 is not a great, or an S3 is not a great running sail. But then again, these squalls may last, you know, half an hour to an hour and a half, and you just want to keep the spinnaker up and keep the boat moving. You're not so worried about the force. You just want to get through the squall, get away from it. The other option that I listed here is winging out a jib. Um, this is very effective BMG, especially on heavy displacement boats, um, where you can sail straight to Hawaii, straight to the finish line, fold out jib, uh, you know, in, in a squall or just in heavy conditions, you may go just as fast with a long out jib than a spinnaker. A Coastal Cup, I don't know, six, five, six years ago, um, and sail on a Swan 53, a very heavy boat. We had our heavy air spinnaker up to blowing about 32, 33. It was really too much for the boat to handle because it was such a heavy boat, so loaded up that we actually took it down, we wung out a jib, uh, and we actually started to go faster. 
And the reason is that the spinnaker on a heavy displacement bow will want to push the bow down, whereas actually winging out a jib will lift the bow out and allow the boat to surf better. So I think that's something really important to figure out with your spinnaker pole or whisker pole, depending on the boat you have. If you have an asymmetric only boat, it's worth investing in getting a uh, some sort of a whisker pole so that you can wing out the jib. Um, here's a photo of that race, the Coastal Cup. This, this is a picture I took. This is a par 40 going downwind with a one hug jib and they were going plenty fast in that condition. Um, it's something you definitely need to practice before you do it for the first time. Because you do it for the first time in you know, 25, 30, 35 knots of wind, it's not that easy. It's really not a that hard thing to do, but if you know what you're doing, it's really easy. If you don't know what you're doing and trying for the first time in 35 knots of breeze, it can be difficult. So, But this is very effective if you're shorthanded, nighttime sailing, not a highly skilled crew, just not confident in your spinnaker, or the boat is just not going any faster than the spinnaker. You get much better BMG going straight to wide, wing on wing like this. Okay, um, going to uh, heavy weather sails. And I believe that you still are under two of the three heavy weather jib, storm jib, storm trisail. I'm not a big believer in the storm trisail. Uh, for sailing to Hawaii, although at some point one of these tropical storms or hurricanes may actually hit, but storm trisels to me are for something that you have prepared when you know there's going to be some heavy weather and we're going across the Atlantic or so. Um, storm, and the reason is, is that most boats don't have a setup for a storm trisel. Um, and again, if you try putting a storm trisail up for the first time in big waves, big seas, you're not going to want to do it. You're just going to laugh. You're going to take your main gun and you're going to laugh. Um, so I, again, I'm not a not a huge fan of storm trisail, but if you're going to go that direction, and it's a great way to go if you're planning to do some distance cruising beyond Hawaii, um, but you need to have a system on how you're going to attack it. And most boats, most production boats, don't have a separate track for them. It's something you can install. Again, it's, you know, it could take away from your budget of other things, and it's something you may hopefully never use. Anyway, so here, here are some options on ways to attach uh, a storm trisail. See? Yeah. Uh, Pacific Cup uh, did adopt the uh, rule change. The U.S. Sailing and World Sailing put out of a 50% uh, luff height. Okay. Uh, on the main now being uh, re re now line. being acceptable as a storm price. Okay. Line, as long as you're carrying a storm jib. Okay. So I you think. can go 50% reduction on the main in heavy weather. You need a one storm sail at least, right? Yeah. So just yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is certainly an option. Uh, putting a reef in at 50 percent or looks, something that's really stupid but yeah well it's something that may not ever get used so it could be expense it could be weight in the sail it could just make your nice main sail not so nice uh but it is a good way to meet the rules so it's something to talk about uh with your sail maker see if it makes sense for your boat um to go that way uh we put a lot of reefs in sails um and, and we put some in in the past in higher locations to meet certain rules like that so that's always something you can consider in your main um to put another reef into the sail that meets the rule so um yeah i like this last one here um i forgot that it's in there that it's in there a while ago but try doing this stuff with your gear on you know, I mean, it's hard enough just doing it, you know, in big seas, but try doing it with your gear on, you know, gloves on and all that, trying to pull pins. It's, you're going to understand why we, you're just going to leave the tricycle in the bag and not want to connect it. It's just, it's just not that easy when a boat is pitching back and forth in big breeze. Okay. Um, you see a lot of these uh, Volvo pictures. You know, an offshore where they're actually using the storm jib design 
kind of be useful as something other than just the storm jib. And here they go with the triple head setup. So they've got like a code 65, you know, uh, jib there. They've got a uh, a regular jib on their on the four triangle here, right? So this is their sprint. So this is their code 65. This is their head stay. So this is just like their medium jib or so. And then they're using the storm jib design really for this routine, but it also qualifies as a storm jib. Probably a little more elaborate than most of you will ever get to, but just just again, you know, using sails for more than just one reason. Um, we don't like to do this, but it can be done. Um, we wouldn't do it in our loft because the fumes are pretty strong, but uh, it, sales can be sent out if you need to get them orange uh, to meet the rule. Nowadays, a rule requires that the sale be entirely orange. There's a grand, if you have a sale built before a certain date, then it can have portions of it that have to have the high visibility orange. Okay, um, sale repair kits, uh, critical to have one. Um, knowing what to bring in a sale repair kit is, uh, you know, not, not something that's commonly known. I think about the, the most important thing you can bring is a pair of shears or scissors. And the material that I think is most important for spinnaker repairs is a four inch wide insignia tape, which comes in rolls. And insignia tape is a, it's a real lightweight woven polyester, like a real lightweight background with adhesive on the back. It's the same material that your sale numbers and your insignia are made out of. It's actually pretty strong for what it is, and it's pretty sticky. And it's really the best for uh, spinnaker repair. The stuff you get at West Marine, you know, the nylon ripstop and so on, and stuff is not that good. It works, but it's not that good. Insignia cloth is much better, much stickier, much stronger. Definitely recommended. All sail makers have it. Uh, that's very important. For upwind sails, the adhesive, ad, or excuse me, adhesives are so good now that you can get material um, with adhesive on the back. The Kevlar um, materials, they're super strong, super low stretch with adhesive on the back. If you get a puncture on your main from a spreader or a puncture on your head sail from a stanch or something, you can get a patch, just get a piece of material and stick it right on and it'll last just fine for the rigs and it's plenty, plenty strong. Um, another thing recommended, uh, you know, is spray glue. We use adhesives in the spray can where if you put a material down with the tear and you just spray underneath it and get it to stick, that, that's pretty effective as well. So there's a lot of different materials you can bring, um, but I think the mo two most important is, uh, is four inch wide insignia cloth and a pair of scissors. Um, also, another important thing to have is some uh, rubbing alcohol or something to dry the sail. If it's wet, damp, salty, you need to rinse it with fresh water and dry it out. But if you have uh, like a rubbing alcohol, you can wipe it clean and then the material will stick to it. So, but again, I think every sailmaker can put you know a kit together. It's critical to have one. If you're in the mode of only carrying two spinnakers, and you ripped one, and now you're down to your last, you're only in class one, then being able to fix your primary sale will be important. Would you use uh, rubbing alcohol before you before acetone to clean the surface? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never really use acetone unless we're trying to clean something off of it. Like we use acetone in the loft all the time to clean off like old numbers or dirt or stuff like that, but I don't know how great acetone really is. Probably not all seem to be more sensitive to the fabric, I think. Okay, all right. That's cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Ever clear. No fuel or no alcohol. It's the same thing. You can use that. Okay, that's that's good to know. Oh, you get the alcohol at CBS or any other pharmacy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions before we shut up?
Like the best comments are about something related to alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Good talk. That's good. Yeah. All right. Speaking of alcohol, um, it's been a great day of presentations. I think uh, I learned a lot. Um, I hope you all did too. Um, we're going to do a couple more of these uh, POA sessions uh, before the race 